So many books are all about knowing. So they help you understand a topic, which is great, but they miss the doing part, which is, okay, now that I understand these principles, now that I understand this philosophy, now that I can express this mindset, how do I actually show up day in and day out and implement it? This is a story about a dude named Lane. And then one day he went and tried to rent them out. And then he became one of the best of me. Hey, Simple Pass Akesha listeners. Today we are going to be talking with Brad Solberg, who is dropping his book that's releasing uh, this week, The Practice of Groundedness. We like to take a break from the real estate investing, tax, legal, infinite banking, which by the way, we're also dropping the infinite banking e-course this week. If you guys want to pick that up, go to simplepassacashflow.com slash banking. A lot of you guys are high pay professionals and what I also say are really type A personalities. With the path to financial freedom, you guys realize that it actually is pretty simple, but how do you, you know, create a well-rounded life? with happiness and something that doesn't crush our soul, which we're going to talk about today. Brad, thanks for coming on. Yeah, Lane, thanks for having me on the show and uh, a chance to, to talk to your community about the new book. Talk to us about how you started. Down. Where did the book come from? I like to think about this topic using the metaphor of a mountain. And when most people see a mountain, the first thing that they notice is the peak. That's where their eyes go. Everybody glances up. And the second thing that you'll notice, particularly if it's a striking or really prominent mountain, is the slope, the steepness of it. No one ever looks at a mountain and says, wow, look at the base of that thing. Yet without a strong and solid base, when rough weather comes, the peak and the slope, they can't hold. They're not stable. The mountain degrades over time. And in my own executive coaching practice, what I've realized, I work with so many um, very high-performing entrepreneurs, executives that have spent so much time focusing on the slope or the metaphorical peak of their mountains and not enough time tending to their foundations or that base. And as a result, even though they experience great conventional success, they often feel a lack of fulfillment. I call this if-then syndrome. They tell themselves a story, if I get promoted into the C-suite, then I'll be content. If... I hit 2 million in saving, then I'll be content. If I buy this house, then I'll be content. And what they find is that once they get to that place where they thought that they'd be content and fulfilled, they're not, they still want more. Some of this is just temperament. You're driven, you're high achieving, you want to strive for greatness. But if that striving for greatness gets way too unchecked, then you don't have fun along the way. You can't experience joy. You constantly feel empty. And that ultimately led me to explore what would it look like to pursue success in a way that is more grounded, hence the title of the book, The Practice of Groundedness. What is the latest research? What do ancient wisdom traditions, what do people that really practice this have to say about building and maintaining a strong foundation, a strong base on top of which any striving can? And the answer is paradoxical. It's not that you stop striving. You don't become a monk in a Zen monastery completely disconnected from the world. What happens is you still strive, but the texture of that striving changes. It goes from a place of compulsion or need or fragility to a place of fulfillment and strength. And that's the practice of groundedness. And then the book obviously explores, well, how do you develop this quality? What are the principles that make for a healthy foundation? And we'll dig into it a little bit more. Personally, like I've literally done that in the last five to 10 years where I have a journal in the form of a spreadsheet, of course, where I've written down like, when I get this, I will be happy when, right? And every six months I've written stuff down. 10 years ago, it's funny. It's I'll be happy when I have three rentals or 11 rentals or when I invest passively in my first invest or apartment. And then it was like moving away from Seattle to Hawaii or having this, I wanted like a C-class Mercedes car. That was a big thing for me. If you do this, you actually write this stuff down. You don't just go on autopilot in life. You start to realize that when you, put that flag in the sand or summit the mountain one step, one tier year at a time, you start to realize it's endless maze or it's just a constant path. I would encourage everybody to go through that exercise. It's probably going to take you guys a handful of years. You guys are really smart and like philosophical about this stuff. You guys will figure it out in maybe six to 12 months. Where do we go from there, Brad? An exercise in the book, in, in a huge part of the book, and, and it walks readers through this, is to reflect on what I call your core values. So these are the things that you most aspire to that make you who you are 
or perhaps even if you really admire or look up to someone else, these are the things that you admire about them. The qualities and characteristics that you see and want to embody yourself. They could be things like health, creativity, love, family, community, vulnerability, presence, authenticity, on and on. You pick between three and five of these. Then it's super important to define them in very concrete terms. Lane, let's say that you tell me a core value of yours is community. That's really ambiguous and broad. What does community mean to you? Give me one or two sentences. I'm, I'm asking you, you don't actually have to do it right now, but really get concrete. What does community mean? Let's do yeah. the exercise. I wouldn't say community is a big, big for you. Maybe like honor. Like, okay, great. Then how would you define honor? Not having like spineless people that just take around you. And I want to personify that, right? I'm not just doing things for money or because it brings me money in the bank. I'll do things that's right at the end of the day. If you think about your day-to-day -day life or your week-to-week -week or month-to-month -month life, what practices can you engage in that represent honor? Do things that make things better at the end of the day for majority of people, not just driven by the bottom line thinking. If you can, and I know I'm putting you on the spot here, get even more concrete. What is that? Give me an action that does that. I mean, find people in my network and cut people out that don't personify that. Or... But then you have those people in your network. So how are you honorable with them? Okay, it's more for things I'm doing personally. Yeah, what are okay. you doing? Yeah. Trying to figure out how to help them, whether investors or employees. I would push you want. to get even more concrete. And maybe it is three times a month, help an investor or an employee in a way that has nothing to do with your own success or bottom line. That then is how you practice honor. What the book asks you to do is identify three to five of these core values, get really concrete like we just did into practices, and then you show up and you practice those values consistently. You start at very noble or honorable core value, and then you get all the way down to habits that you can practice. And that helps ground you in the present moment. Because regardless if you get that C-class or you get that house or you get that passive income, whatever it is, you can show up today, act in alignment with your core values. And it's really ironic. We think, and so many bullshit self-help offers tell us this, that we need to be like super motivated and inspired to get going. But what all the latest scientific research says is actually the opposite. You need to get going to give yourself a chance to feel inspired or motivated. You don't have to engage in positive thinking or self-talk or get all hyped up. You just show up and act consistently in alignment with your core values. And I argue that's ultimately the key to building this kind of grounded foundation upon which you can strive. There are two ways to strive for that C-class. One is without this foundation and you get there and you might be pretty stoked for a day, maybe even a week, but then ultimately you feel empty. It's like, well, you said, crap, what's the next thing? The other way is to strive by showing up day to day, consistently acting on your core values. And then the C-class, you enjoy it. It's a nice thing to have, but it doesn't leave you immediately seeking the next thing because you've built a steady foundation that day in and day out. Because that C-class gets old and a little dirty. Researchers call this the arrival fallacy. And the arrival fallacy is just that. So many people, myself at times included, this is all humans, we tell ourselves a story that will arrive when something magical happens, but the goalpost is always 10 yards down the field. We never really arrive. We've got to learn how to be able to embrace the process of going for outcomes that we care about because it's the process that makes up our days. It's about also, you could argue, it's, it's shifting from an outcome-oriented mindset to a process-oriented mindset. And if you nail the process and you enjoy the process, the outcomes take care of themselves. Whereas if you're so fixated on these certain outcomes, it can cause you to become pretty anxious and restless. And I think that's exactly what I do. We're like Whenever we do a deal, I personally find like one little stupid thing I want to buy on Amazon or like a little reward to get me to that next goal post. I also do this with my teams. I'll tell them like, what's a goal? What's something that you guys want on Amazon again? Because it's easy. <laughs> like yeah. when, when we hit a goal, you'll get that. But yeah, I guess what you're telling me, that's the wrong way of going about it, right? That's the achievers. Again, I want to be clear. It's okay to buy a nice watch, buy a nice car, whatever it is. This is not about not achieving or not chasing goals. I think what I am saying is it's about not getting so fixated on those goals and instead figuring out what can I do today to show up, live alignment in my core values? How can I be present? How can I be patient? How can I be vulnerable? How can I build community? How can I do these things that I know are going to be the solid foundation that are there for me and that keep me strong regardless of what's happening externally? This is the stuff where your portfolio absolutely crushes out of your mind performance 
And this foundation provides you gravity. So you don't completely go off the rocker and make a mistake, take a risk that's unnecessary. The flip side is also true. We go through a recession, a portfolio tanks. There's some kind of external event that you could have never imagined. It's this foundation that holds you up during those difficult times. And again, the whole argument of the book is so much about the current culture tells us to only focus on the peak of the mountain or the slope. Again, this is the metaphor for our own lives. And we neglect these foundational principles that are really the most important thing that support everything else. What is another common value that you see and what are maybe few habits that you've stumbled upon that you see a lot of I think one that your listenership in particular, Lane, will, will resonate with is taking something that is very common in sound investors and applying it to all of your life, which is don't go for like big heroic efforts. Don't try to hit home runs. Just consistently put the ball in play. Small steps consistently taken over long periods of time lead to big gains. In investing, this is the rule of compounding. But the rule of compounding is also true for developing relationships, for taking control of your health, for better nutrition, for really any kind of daily practice. Again, the current culture says you should find a way to hack your way to greatness. There's overnight success. Take 19 different supplements and you'll be Superman or Superwoman. And none of that's true, of course. The real way to get long-term gains, no different than investing, is to be patient and take consistent small steps over time. Doesn't mean that you shouldn't adjust your strategy as you go, but if you try to swing for the fences, you often strike out. So it's much better to just have small, consistent gains. That's how you build a durable base. So that's one key value of groundedness. Another key value of groundedness is this notion of accepting where you are to get where you want to go. So often we don't see clearly the current situation that we're in. We put on our like rose tinted glasses and we tell ourselves a story that it's better than it really is or it'll quickly change or a whole bunch of these kinds of stories that delude ourselves from actually seeing reality for what it is. And it feels good in the short term, but in the long term, it's detrimental because if you're not clear about what's actually in front of you, then you can't take wise action to impact. So there's a practice in the book around self-distancing because so often we're better at giving advice to our friends than ourselves. For areas of our lives that we're really struggling with, the exercise is pretend that a close friend is in the exact same situation as you. What advice would you give that friend? And then go do that thing. So often people give advice to a friend that's very different than what they're doing. It's so simple, but it's hard. The example of this is I've worked with some elite athletes and they hate being injured. And I've coached elite athletes that are literally limping out the door with a sprained hamstring to go do their workout because they don't want to miss it. And I say, Jim, if you saw a training partner limping out the door to do a workout, what would you tell him? He's like, I tell him just rest, take one or two more days off so you don't blow up your hamstring. And then it's like, why are you limping out the door to do a workout? Like you need to follow that advice yourself. Acceptance, seeing situations clearly, even when you necessarily, even when you don't necessarily want to is another key principle. Community. We talked a little bit about this, but investing in relationships, realizing that if you are going to take this process view of life, much of what makes a process fulfilling and enjoyable is the people that you're along the ride with. And I think what happens too often with high achievers is we become so focused on what's out in front of us, so focused on efficiency and optimization that it cannibalizes the time and energy that we need to build those close relationships. So it's a little bit about reprioritizing the role of community in our lives. Obviously, COVID has made that challenging over the last year and a half, but I think we're seeing even more so just how important it is because we're realizing like, wow, it's really tough to be isolated. So those are just a few other examples. That community thing is a big importance and especially in invest. A lot of people, they listen to the podcast while they're doing chores or just stay in their boxers on their computer. These are the guys who go through the syndication e-course. But the whole point is you get to know a little bit baseline so that if you do happen to find other credit investors, you can build those relationships and that's the community aspect of it. And we do a lot better in communities too. We like to think and tell ourselves a story that we're the center of the universe, but we're actually not. We're just a little speck. And the people with whom we surround ourselves have an enormous impact on us. So the best way to be a really thoughtful, patient, consistent investor is to surround yourself with really patient, thoughtful, consistent investors. The best way to become a great athlete is to surround yourself with other great athletes. The best way to become a loving, patient parent is to develop relationships with other loving, patient parents. And again, I think what happens in our like outward-focused optimization hustle culture 
is we spend so much time pushing forward for these things out in front of us that we neglect the time and energy to build those communities. Going back to the whole community thing, your network is your net worth is what we always say. And I still have free onboarding calls. If you guys want to get signed up for that, please go to the website. Uh, I think it's bullpassacastle.com slash contact. But we ask you guys to join the club first, do your pre-work first before booking that call with me. Some strange people that they'd like to do everything by themselves. They're, most of them are introverts, obviously, but these are the guys like investing in notes and private money lending and they're, they stay to themselves. To them, they think 1031 exchanges is a good idea. Their, their strategy is just whack, right? And <laughs> there's a huge difference between those people like that and people who get all these other investment concepts that we get. And the biggest difference is like those people don't interact and play nice with others. And from somebody who sees a whole bunch of different people, the successful people and the people who they might have a semi high net worth, but they're just doing it the wrong way. They're driving around with the handbrake on. It's the ability to who you know and collecting the best practices from your network. So just another plug for community there. But Brad, your kind of mindset, I like. I, I really personify with the stoicism type of mindset. For those of you guys not aware of that, I'll let you define that for us. Yeah. So the Stoics, it's a group of thought that came out of the ancient Roman Empire. And it is very much one of trying to cultivate equanimity. So an ability to absorb life's highs and lows. And Counter to common belief, stoicism is not about not feeling emotion or not showing emotion. I think a lot of people are very misconstrued and confused about that because we hear, oh, you're so stoic, you don't show emotion. No, the stoics had tons of emotion. But what they realized is that a human life is going to contain all kinds of highs and all kinds of lows. And if you're going to have skin in the game and you're going to care deeply about pursuits, eventually those pursuits are going to break your heart because they don't always go your way. And what stoicism teaches is that you take the highs and you smile and then you kiss them goodbye and you take the lows and you let them hurt you and then you kiss them goodbye because everything's impermanent. There's this quote at the start of uh, the book from a stoic philosopher Epictetus that said, people complain that their hands and feet are hurting and calloused. Of course, your hands and feet are hurting. If you're going to live a life and you're going to use your hands and feet, then your hands and feet will become hurting and callous. The point being that there is no free lunch. And if you want to have skin in the game and you want to put yourself out there, uh, it is going to be distressing at times. And we have to accept that. And if we refuse to accept that, what ends up happening is we don't take risks. Our lives become smaller, not larger. Or we delude ourselves and we pretend that none of that bad stuff's going to happen. And when it does, we get totally surprised and completely blown apart. Another stoic lesson that I like is the obstacle is the way when things yep. are getting tough, that should be a good sign for you. That usually makes most of the other competition give up. And when you get past that obstacle, things are going to be much better for you due to lower competition. The book I talk about being at the point of discomfort. So growth comes from being a little bit uncomfortable. If you're always comfortable, you're probably not growing. This is true in any domain of life. So it's really important to identify what areas of my life do I want to grow in. Could be anything from lifting weights, becoming a better investor, being in more intimate relationships, learning more about NASCAR, you name it. And if you're completely comfortable in those areas of your life, then you're not setting yourself up for growth. Now, this isn't about jumping off the deep end. That just leads to anxiety. That's no fun. It's about finding just manageable challenge. That's what I call them in the book. Things that are ever so slightly outside your comfort zone and then going and pursuing those things. Again, you don't want to do this in all areas of your life at the same time either because that can be overwhelming. But for those select areas that you do want to grow in, it's so helpful to make yourself a little bit uncomfortable. I see this play out and I see people get a lot of success with this, especially like most of our listeners are introverts. They don't really, they're a little scared of people. They come out to the Hawaii meetup and the retreat and they meet their tribe, more introverted people that are interested in these types of uh, financial topics and their financial fa fanatics. But yeah, I think a lot of you guys, I don't want to pigeonhole the audience, but I think a lot of you guys out there do subscribe to the stoic philosophy and I think it's your jam. And and I then, do think there's a lot of misconception around introverts too, Lane. I think that introverts, and I'm an introvert, we get this rap as being like very much wanting to be isolated and left alone. And what the research shows is that's not the case at all. 
What introverts generally want is really deep connection and focus and conversation. If you go to a huge party, which most introverts don't like doing, it's hard to have that, especially if it's a deep party where you don't know anyone. You're not going to get that one-on-one -on -one intimacy or finding your tribe. Whereas most introverts thrive in small groups of like-minded people. So it's not this, I'm either in or out. It's, do I thrive walking into a room with all kinds of people? Or do I want to be a little bit more deliberate and intentional about how I build that community? So for introverts, it's kind of like, you know, you're, you're getting it out of your comfort zone. And when you feel it typically is a good sign. And so the other two that I wanted to briefly go over, Brad, if you could help us explain, you also follow the ancient wisdom of Buddhism and Taoism. What are mm -hmm. kind of like the two big takeaways from those two for those people who aren't super familiar? Yeah. So like Stoicism, a huge takeaway from Buddhism is this notion of impermanence, which is that everything changes. As an investor, it's really important to remember that because it prevents you from clinging to the highs and then being really disappointed when they're no longer high or getting so caught up in the lows that you become despairing and depressed. So you could sum up Buddhism in two words or the teachings of Buddhism, which is everything changes. And I actually think that's really empowering because what it means is that the future is not yet determined. And if we can build again, this strong foundation of groundedness to support everything else that we do in our life, the stuff that comes and goes and changes, we'll be able to hold all of that see it clearly, and then take wise action as a result. And Taoism is very much about paying close attention to what is going on around you. Ancient Taoism, they called it the way. And the way is the flow of the universe. And what Taoism teaches is that we are always operating in harmony with what's around us at the highest level. I alluded to this earlier, you never really go at it alone. And paying attention to what's happening around you is so important for yourself. And I think all of these ancient wisdom traditions, they really point toward the value of, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but accepting and seeing things clearly so that you can take wise action, being really present. That's a part of seeing things clearly, paying close attention, patience, which is letting things unfold on their own time, taking small steps for big gains, realizing that consistency compounds, not trying to always hit home runs, but being really deliberate and just walking a long path, having a long view and vulnerability, which is about putting your skin in the game. It's really easy to fake it and be too cool to care. And I believe that's a protective mechanism because you're scared to actually try something. Because if you try something, you could fail and you have to be okay with that. So other than picking up your book, The Practice of Groundedness on Amazon, Brad Solberg, B-R-A-D-S-T-U-L-B-E-R-G. Any other last parting thoughts? I really appreciate you having me on me, Lane. If you all liked what I had to say, I'd be honored if you read the book. I tried to write it in a way, I guess this will be my last thought. I wanted to close the knowing doing gap in this book. So many books are all about knowing. So they help you understand a topic, which is great, but they miss the doing part, which is okay, now that I understand these principles, now that I understand this philosophy, now that I can express this mindset, how do I actually show up day in and day out and implement it? In every single page of this book, I checked against the criteria of, will this be valuable for someone to actually do something in their life that is productive and different as a result? And I think that for anything that you read, whether it's my book or something else, I would really push yourself to realize it's one thing to know and be able to talk about something, it's another thing to do it and practice it, which is why the title is not just groundedness. It's the practice of groundedness. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for doing that because that's what drives me crazy. And why don't I try not to read too many books? Cause like, they like tell me all these stupid scientific studies. Like what's the one, the power of habit. That was a horrible book. It just told me all these stupid, like scientific studies and nothing, like nothing practical that I could implement. I just wasted my time. I hope that if you guys read my book, it'll be a very different experience because I tried to write like the kind of anti that book. I want every single page to be, Hey, here are concrete practices that you can implement in your daily life that will make you more grounded. And I think that's maybe that's a type A in me. Like everything I do, everything I spend my time on, it should create some kind of habit change or actionable item. If it isn't, it's just wasting your time. Yeah. But I need to be more grounded and chill out a little bit. Too. Well, you'll read the book <laughs> and hopefully um, your whole community does too. I, I appreciate you having me on the show today. Thanks, Brad. Again, the practice of groundlessness.
and get out of your comfort zone, guys. Join our community, simplepassivecashflow.com slash club. I don't know why you haven't signed up yet. And uh, reach out to me. Book your onboard and call. I won't fight. I'm a real person. So many people have been listening for two to three years. And they're just finally now picking up the Zoom call and talking to me. Those yeah. are your action items. Pick up Those the practice of groundedness, read, practice, and pick up the phone and uh, call Lane or schedule yeah. your onboarding call. I won't yell at you guys. I promise. All right, Lane. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, everyone, for listening. And if you pick up the book, I appreciate it. Take care, everyone. This website offers very general information concerning real estate for investment purposes. Every investor situation is unique. Always seek the services of licensed third-party appraisers and inspectors to verify the value and condition of any property you intend to purchase. Use the services of professional title and escrow companies and licensed tax, investment, and or legal advisor before relying on any information contained herein. Information is not guaranteed as in every investment there is risk. The content found here is just my opinion and things change and I reserve the right to change my mind. Above all else, do your own analysis and think for yourself because in the end, you are the only person who is going to look out for your best interests.